Okay, all right. Well, I'm here today with my teacher and one of my favorite humans, Norman Blair. So Norman, um, Norman is my teacher um, and I'm also one of his mentees. Is that the right expression? That's a, that's a good description. Mentee, yes. Um, and yeah, so I've just thought it would be a really lovely idea to actually bring you on here and just talk about a few things. So do you want to introduce yourself quickly, Norman? Hi, um, I'm Norman um, and I'm a long-term yoga practitioner, long-term teacher. I'm, uh, I practice also uh, meditation. Um, I love hugging trees. Which I'm going to share with you, Louise. You're a bit of a tree hugger, aren't you? Yes, I am. I'm not ashamed to say so. <laughs> um, I sometimes think uh, we could do better hugging trees rather than going to yoga classes. Sometimes, uh, yeah. Not, not so always. How, long, how long have you been teaching, Norman? Um, I started teaching in 2001. And it's funny, Louise, I've just been writing um, another article on Yoga Teachers Pay. And as part of that, I was uh, researching um, my own teaching. And uh, yeah, I, I had notes where I was teaching at um, What Was Home's Place mm -hmm. in uh, 2001. It was That's going uh, back, yeah. Yeah, it became Virgin Active in 2006. Yeah. And in 2001, an hour's class at Home's Place, I was paid £30. There you go. And uh, Virgin Active had just bought in a new pay scheme, and um, it's uh, £28.50 an hour. So yeah. 19 years, pay's gone down. Yeah, do you know, like coming from the fitness background, it was the same. You know, when I started teaching in 1992, I think we were getting something like 20 pounds a class. And yeah, it's not much different to that now. But yeah, there we go. So yeah, teaching a long time. And, and were you teaching, um, what style of yoga did you start off teaching? So I was, um, started practicing Ashtanga yoga in probably like, maybe 1994, mm -hmm. and um, started self-practicing Ashtanga at the end of the 90s. And so when I started teaching, I was teaching Ashtanga or modified version of Ashtanga. And then in um, two, when was, no, autumn 2001 actually, yeah, that's right, autumn 2001, I came across yin yoga. I was at a weekend up at the Manchester Buddhist Center and there was a teacher called uh, Padma Dashini. And uh, she taught a yin class. And I was like, wow, this stuff is really, really interesting. And um, by nature, I'm the antithesis of yin. <laughs> <laughs> I need yin, Louise. And I need stuff that kind of slows me down. And also, as a, as a practitioner, I'm strong. And when someone says to me, oh, how do you do like an arm balance? I'm like, surely it's easy. But I'm not necessarily very mobile. And um, what I found, yin was really kind of, influencing me, impacting me in different ways, which so there's a physicality, but also this whole slowing down and softening and taking time. And because within yin, as you know very well, Louise, patience, patience. It is, yeah. It's a long game, isn't it? <laughs> Quite a long game, actually. A long game, yeah. Someone, someone recently described yin to me as the introvert of the yoga family. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. Nice. I think we always, those of us that sort of like go down the yin path and really love it, we, see, we always seem to find it at that point when we really need it, don't we? But it, to me, it's been so illuminating to watch the transformation of this practice from really being very marginalized. Yeah. Maybe, you know, how yoga itself was. I remember I became a vegetarian in the early 1980s and that was really odd. Yeah. And now, like, isn't it like half of the teenagers are vegetarian? Yeah, it's, it's normal, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yoga's gone from like, you know, the 1970s in like kind of church halls, you know, forget about Lululemon leggings. Yeah. Whole church halls with like, you know, wearing whatever and uh, gone very mainstream. And yeah. so with yin yoga in, the, in that time, to the early 2000s, it was, so when I started teaching a weekly class, in uh, 2003, um, as I'm, I'm pretty confident that was the first, the only yin yoga class in, on a timetable in London. Mm -hmm. And now there's something like maybe 200 a week. Yeah. Do you think that it's quite well known now what the perception of yin actually is within 
generally? Do you, or do you think that there's still a belief that it's restorative? And um, I mean, which of course it is by nature because we're resting, but it's, you know, it's not just... Well, we're resting at an edge, aren't we? Yeah. Noise, we ourselves can choose what that edge is. What I find is um, that there are some yin teachers who are described as militant yin teachers. Mm. It's like they're being quite yang in yeah. how they teach yin. And as um, I know you've come across this and I've certainly come across this, practitioners come into the yin being very yang and then it becomes a bit like a car crash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I wonder if that's because some of, a lot of the shapes have similarities, don't they? Where, yeah. you know, where they would be holding that same shape more actively for five breaths, and that they're then there for considerably longer. Five minutes rather than five it, breaths. It becomes like a battle of wills. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, you know, what's the point? And I collect, um, I call them uh, my first ever yin experience. It's a bit like my first ever kiss. And oh. <laughs> some of them are fascinating Louise and people you know saying you know I came into this practice and it was all about achieving the posture and then I couldn't get up out of bed the next day I'm like well it's not surprising it's like and that's one of the great teachings of the yin practice of like let's come into this with a much softer steadier approach rather than trying to push ourselves with almost like bullying the body yeah yeah I agree so is, is that the, all that you teach now? Do you still teach any? Because I, I know that I've done your lovely Ash version of Ashtanga on Richard. Yeah, it's, it's gone completely <laughs> off message these days. And especially since uh, lockdown on Zoom, you know, my version of Ashtanga is way gone. Is well, it? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's, well, I think, you know, teach, you know, that's, Yin is built for Zoom. It is, and, yeah. Um, whereas I find, I feel that, say, a complicated vinyasa sequence or, you know, not so much ashtanga, but it's like, it's more of a challenge to teach out on Zoom. Mm -hmm. Safely, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I, what I, t I call it ashtanga with love and props. Yeah. And, uh, when I say that, um, if anyone's a real kind of dogmatic ashtanga and they see the words love and props, they will not come, which I'm happy. Oh, I thought it was great. I mean, I, I was actually thinking, only this morning, actually, it was a year ago that mm -hmm. I was getting getting ready to come to Crete. Actually, in fact, you probably already left, didn't you? Because <laughs> you you oh, went yeah. to land, didn't you? You went on the train. Yeah. Uh, so much happens in a year, Louise. Doesn't it just? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Those morning practices were lovely. They were really lovely. Well, you know, to cheer cheer things up, Louise, Mighty Pushpa and I are in discussion with Yoga Rocks about oh. going back October next year. Oh, I'll be there. I'll definitely be there. I loved it there so much. It was, just place. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. And the, the food more than anything. The food was amazing. Oh, my teaching. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. I'm very, uh, very happy you preferring the food over my teaching. Oh, no, the food, the food is memorable, actually. So I would just definitely say to anybody, go for the food. Um, so this year, so then obviously COVID this year. So as as we all have, we didn't we all adapt at the speed like literally at the click of a finger. We just adapted to this this way of online teaching. And I know that both you mm -hmm. and Mike Krishna did a lot, didn't you, for your your community of students as free offerings in the beginning. I think this is it. You know, this is about. Um, community about strengthening connections and this is a way that um, we can deal with the difficulties and so yeah that's what my Bushwa and my aspiration was was to help people connect even when we're disconnected and mm -hmm. it's funny because I've had people I had people ask me you know before um, the pandemic of like oh will you teach online we do trainings online and I was like absolutely not mm. and then since March that's all I've done yeah yeah how have you found I know that you've um you've done some of your trainings as well so you you did, have you done did you do both of your five day and your nine day online so far I've done yeah I've done all, all the trainings we offer online and um it's worked surprisingly well Louise but I I long to be back you know seeing people as you know you were when you came here and yeah. you know much push and i 
we wish to create a bubble of transformation. And obviously that's harder online, but then, you know, there are plenty of pluses, like you don't have to commute. Yeah. You don't have to deal with the Piccadilly line. You don't <laughs> have to kind of spend money on accommodation. And there was a course that um, I ran a while back with uh, Kate, who you know, Kate. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, uh, on the course, there was someone from um, New Hampshire on the east coast of the US and also someone from Hong Kong. So <laughs> I could watch, um, it was like uh, early morning in, on the east coast and then I could watch the sunrise while yeah. in Hong Kong the sun was setting simultaneously. So there are pluses, but once this is over and it will definitely be over and I'm increasingly optimistic about it being over, you know, hopefully by, I would say spring next year, yeah. and then go back into meeting each other in what I describe as physical proximity. Though this pandemic is a warning to us, and I think as human beings increasingly invasively interact with nature, there will be more pandemics. So in a way, this, is, this has been a training for us, and we've been actually incredibly fortunate that coronavirus has such a low fatality rate. Yeah. Because Things like Ebola, that's got an 80% okay. fatality rate. Yeah. Now the, yeah. the SARS of the um, 2000s had something like 10%. Yeah. We've yeah. been Yeah, I agree. I think it is a warning. So I know that you're very active with Extinction Rebellion. And I remember being very proud of you, actually, when you said that you'd got arrested. Yeah. Early I was year. arrested. Yes. Yes. Oh, Norman. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you become to get involved with that? I know that you, you, you in fact, you probably, this week you went marching, didn't you? Yeah, Tuesday, um, I was yeah. blockading Parliament. Yeah. And uh, it was funny for me blockading Parliament because I was also blockading Parliament in 1983. Were you? I know. For some people watching this, they're going to be, what's 1983? <laughs> we weren't even born then, were they? <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, yeah. That's like 37 years ago when they bought cruise missiles yeah. into the country and uh -huh. um, myself and several hundred other people blockaded parliament in protest. So I have, I protest, I campaign and I, I believe in sustainability, Louise. And mm -hmm. you know, in a way this links also to the mentoring and I see a supervisor and I personally believe that all yoga teachers can benefit from yeah. mentoring because what I'm fascinated by is how can we ensure our sustainability? So, and then we could talk about social sustainability because, you know, I saw a front cover of a newspaper this morning and it was like, you know, a demand that we get back flying again. I'm like, why? I know. Why, you know, so it's like, you know, the environment is finite. Our impact is enormous and we need to be more conscious about what we're doing. So these are some of the reasons that I'm involved in Extinction Rebellion. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think there's, there's a big part of me that thinks all of this pandemic is nature's way of getting us to stop spending money that we don't have, stop going to places that we don't need to, stop, you know, just be a little bit more thoughtful about what we're doing in, with the earth. I, I think in some way, you know, it's also been, you know, a huge trauma tragedy for many you know many people yeah. in the uk thousands and thousands of people have lost their lives around the world you know people have had their lives enormously disrupted and yet still i feel in some ways like you know particularly in the kind of the early weeks of the lockdown i felt in some ways it was like the earth was breathing a sigh of relief yeah like oh, the, yeah, it was a, wasn't it a, the most magnificent spring wasn't it the skies were clear yeah. you know, where i live there were no car sounds. And I remember maybe it was in about May or so, and I was walking, um, so I'm in Tempat Lane in North London, and I went up to the station and I was like, oh no, I can smell the exhaust fumes. Oh. <laughs> For at least like maybe a couple of months, the air got really clean. I can't imagine what that must have been like there actually in London. Because I've, I've, I've run down that turnpike lane on the way <laughs> for the train, so I know how fumey it gets. So, yeah, yeah. So I, I have been very lucky to be, to be, have been taught by you and oh, continue you. to be mentored by you. And I, I do think it's very important for 
all teachers or anybody really who's sort of like passes on a skill to another person to be a recipient of mentoring. Um, and I, I think like new teachers often don't get that. They do their 200 hours and then they're kind of like, off you go. <laughs> You're out in the world now. And it's, it's quite daunting for them, isn't it? So what advice would you give a new, a brand newly qualified teacher? Take it slowly. Yeah. Um, I remember Sarah Powers. So I'm merely passing on ideas and information that I've got from many wonderful teachers like Sarah Powers, like Judith Lasseter, like Richard Freeman. Take it slowly. If you can, um, do not depend just on yoga teaching. Have other ways of um, being able to financially manage. Take it slowly. Do not rush. Get support. We all need support. So I see support in different ways. So the support, what you might call peer group support, mm. but also we need what you might describe as a more um, facilitated support of a, perhaps a more experienced teacher. And so the person I get my supervision from, she's in Brighton and um, she used to be my psychotherapist and she's in her early 70s. So getting these ideas and she's been great for me, really helpful at times. And I've kind of seen her like a, a sword of truth. And sometimes in peer groups, we might not be so keen on swords of truth because we have an, an emotional investment into a friendship. We don't want to rock the boat. So I think everyone, all yoga teachers should be mentored. And I think this is a way of coming back to sustainability. Mm. It's a way of helping us to be more sustainable. This is a way of support. I call it sometimes like helping hands. We yeah. all need helping hands. And also about raising aspirations and encouraging confidence. So something else I'm involved in is the Yoga Teachers Union. And this is about empowering us rather than perhaps being uh, bullied. And this definitely yeah. happens in Yoga Land. And some of the uh, business practices in, in Yoga Land are very poor in my opinion. Mm. Yes, there, I mean, it's, there is still this, um, this idea that yoga teachers should be teaching for the love of it. I would it's really non-yogic to expect yeah. any kind of financial reward in return. Well, it's, it's mostly like the air. Exactly, exactly. You know, yeah. I had someone who's been teaching since like probably the early mid nineties. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was first teaching, you know, I was teaching just for the love, but I know she comes from a very wealthy background. So I'm like, yeah, you can afford to teach for the love. And I'm very much into like, inclusivity and into fairness and if you're just saying oh well you should just teach for the love what how inclusive is that because essentially you're saying well this is only people who are wealthy enough who are allowed to teach and everyone else yes teach. you know something else i want to bring in louise is the importance of transparency mm -hmm. and you know i've talked i've written about my own income and i've asked for studios to be transparent around the rates of pay yeah. I, come across quite a few studios that have told teachers they must not tell other people how much they're being paid. And this is appalling. Yeah, but that's, but that's, that's very common in the corporate world, isn't it? That you get drummed into you, you must not share what you're earning. But Louise, we can if remember- If everybody earns the same, then what's the problem? Yeah. If it's- <laughs> we cannot, But also we can, I think this kind of stuff started coming in from the early 1980s. Yeah. And this whole, you know, what, what we've seen in the last 40 years is this, what you might describe as neoliberal individualism. And we're now having to deal with the um, fallout of it. Mm -hmm. Neoliberal individualism is not very good in the pandemic. No, no, it's not. No, no. So where do you, what would you, I mean, obviously if we sit here now, on the 4th of September in the year 2020. If you were back on the 4th of September 2019 <laughs> and you'd have looked forward, you wouldn't have seen this. So let's have a look forward to the 4th of September 2021. What, what, what would you anticipate that that future looks like? Um, oh, I, I think one of the best answers to a question like that, Louise, is who knows? Yeah. It's like really, you know, we're living in very um, strange times and, mm -hmm. you know, we've got the American election coming up in a couple of months and it's like, wow, yeah. you know, who, 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 no one would have predicted a pandemic 
yet some people did. And yeah. I think this is one of the important points that people are saying, well, sooner or later, something like this is going to happen. Yeah. But other people were burying their heads in the sand. So I suppose coming back to the idea of community and connection, mm -hmm. that this is about developing community. This is about connecting with each other because from that, we can be more resilient. And also what I aspire towards is this understanding that, and you know, both you and I know this so much from our own experience, that we can change things in positive ways. Yeah. We, we are able to be more constructive in how we live our lives, rather than just allowing things to happen to us. Yeah, everybody, it's that choice thing, isn't it? You have, there's a, always a choice between your actions and your reactions. Yeah. Always, yeah. And that's one of the things I've been talking about recently in Yen, actually, Louise, of when you're in that kind of posture in that last minute, and it's like, I'm saying, well, you've got one more minute. <laughs> I say, do you react? Yeah. Which is, oh, my God, another minute. Or are you responsive? Which is, oh, another minute. So if you're reactive, then ease the edge. If you're mm -hmm. responsive, stay as you are stay as you are yeah thank you norman so just one last thing that i really would love to ask you so i know that we both share a real big love of reading um and we've we've read a lot of the same books <laughs> um so what are you reading right now um so i'm reading a great book at the moment um which you might be surprised by louise it's by an american guy called Michael Greger, mm -hmm. and it's called How Not to Diet. Oh. <laughs> it's really good. So essentially what it's saying, Louise, I'm, so I'm very succinctly summarizing here, but it's saying it's not the cake, it's the chemicals. <laughs> <laughs> it's really good. It's heavily, heavily like I'm on to page like 120 and he's already, and it's reference 1200. It's like 10 references per page. And it's, it's very good. So he's really critiquing the food industry and he's critiquing you know, how many chemicals, the toxins, we're, you know, we're in this kind of toxic sea. And one of the points he's making is that some of the chemicals actually cause obesity. So obesity isn't necessarily just about mm. what we're eating, it's also about the chemicals in our food supply. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm actually reading the James Nestor book at the moment. Oh, right? Great book. Oh, good. It's really good. It's, it's really interesting. You know, all these little things like the, the BMI index now of America, the average American is considerably higher than what it was in the 60s. Um, just because obviously food is a lot more processed, probably we're not getting as much exercise. Eat carrots. Yeah, well, chew your food. That's it, isn't it? Food that you need yeah, to chew. The point that Michael Greger is making, which is an excellent point, is the food industry can make a lot more profit out of processed food than out yeah. of apples. And he's yeah. saying, like, you know, you could eat, you know, you could eat like twenty apples, or you drink like a liter of apple juice, and they have significantly different impact on your body. Yeah. Eat carrots. Eat apples. Yeah, actual food. And some cake. And some cake, carrot, some carrot cake. <laughs> really good, Louise, I like that. Oh, full of bright ideas. Thank you, Norman. Thank you so much for this. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, any last words from you at all? <laughs> Keep aspiring. Keep aspiring. Keep yeah. aspiring. And I, I, do you know what, Louise, I want to say, Let's be, you know, let's dare to dream about mm -hmm. the ways of being because they are possible. And, you know, how we've been living is hugely different from how it was just a hundred years ago. Yeah. So God only knows what it will be like in a hundred years time, but we can dream that things are better, that we live in a, a fairer and a more sustainable way. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you so much, thank you. You're welcome.